honored to serve a church that has been doing prophetic ministry since 1796. My time here in Center City, Philadelphia is very different from my childhood memories of my fa family's alfalfa farm in Fallon, Nevada. Both the farm community and this urban religious community have taught me to honor the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. In the context of our congregation's commitment to sustainability and transparency, it is my responsibility to inform you that the church indirectly owns stock in the Monsanto company through a mutual fund. On Monday, Monsanto posted a fiscal first quarter loss of $19 million, resulting in a loss of three cents per share, as compared with a profit of $1 per share for the same period last year. Why was Monsanto's stock worth more during last year's financial crisis? My hunch is that recently the public has become more aware of Monsanto's tainted history, resulting, resulting in a binary public opinion. On one hand, Monsanto is perceived as intimidating farmers, misleading consumers, bullying journalists, silencing scholars, contaminating vital ecosystems, and being one of the small number of multinational corporations that legally own the origins of the world's food supply. Now, on the other hand, Monsanto is experiencing a renaissance by seeking to double the yield in their core crop by 2030 through efficient and sustainable means to meet the food, fiber, and fuel needs of an additional three billion people, to protect endangered species in Brazil, to protect the water quality in the Mississippi River, to provide a drought-tolerant maze to five African nations, and to advocate for human rights. I share this contradiction in public opinion, in public perception, to highlight how Monsanto's rancid past presently meets with its forward-thinking leaders who have invited us to meet with them to engage in respectful dialogue because of their pledge to listen more and to lead responsibly. Such an invitation leads me to believe that our collective purpose is not simply to engage in the moral issues of our time, but to apply the modern spiritual discipline of sustainability based on the ancient practices of stewardship. In this context, our conversation with Monsanto changes from what we are against, injustice, secrecy, pollution, domination, to what we are for, justice, transparency, sustainability, and equality. In my November letter to the CEO of Monsanto, a series of moral questions were posed to Mr. Grant. In particular, would he make a public promise to guarantee the world citizenry that Monsanto will spend the next century healing, not harming the environment? healing, not harming any animals or humans. I invited him to meet with a group of interfaith clergy and ethicists to craft a 21st century Hippocratic Oath for biotechnology, the three core principles of which are derived from biomedical ethics. First, the term non-maleficence refers to the philosophy of Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, whose writings ask medical professionals to make this vow, to do no harm. Meaning at times it can be wise to do nothing than to do something that may cause more harm than good. The second principle 
is beneficence, the moral obligation to act for the benefit of others. Monsanto has already produced a public statement to this effect, quote, we will use sound and innovative science and thoughtful and effective stewardship to deliver high quality products that are beneficial to our customers and to the environment. Building upon this pledge, Monsanto has demonstrated the intent to implement a third ethic, distributive justice. When applied to the pursuit of doubling the yield in their core crops in the next two decades, the goal of feeding the world hungry only becomes feasible through the fair, equitable, and appropriate distribution of food. By making the pledge to practice distributive justice, beneficence, and non-maleficence, Mr. Grant has the opportunity to lead not only his company, but the entire field of biotechnology in creating a 21st century oath to be named after him. Imagine the unveiling of the Grant Oath, calling those who produce genetically modified foods to consider the possible harm that any pursuit of scientific advancement may have on people, animals, or the environment. Imagine if Mr. Grant were to leave this enduring legacy to humanity, inviting his colleagues to join him in affirming the following proposed oath, which we will read together aloud. Together we say, I promise to use my expertise to help and not harm people, animals, and the environment. I promise to practice responsibly the ancient ethic of stewardship and the modern principle of sustainability by affirming distributive justice as a moral obligation to benefit the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. The moral invitation to craft such an oath is done with the knowledge that the suffering caused in the past is now met with the good will offered in the present, which has the potential to influence our collective future. My hope is that as we travel next week to St. Louis to meet with Mr. Grant and his colleagues, as we participate in the annual shareholders meeting, we will be able to practice deep listening and loving speech. May we use this opportunity to build relationships based on respect, trust, and to collaborate on the creation of a 21st century oath to do no harm, to benefit others in the spirit of justice. Let us close by reading aloud our stewardship proverb. Together we say, we pick fruit from trees we did not plant, we draw water from wells we did not dig. This is as it should be, so long as we dig and plant for those who will come after.